Hey everyone, uh, I'm Deepthi. I'm a protocol engineer at Owen Labs. Hi, I'm Nathan. I'm also a protocol engineer here at Owen Labs. Um, so today in our presentation, we'll be giving you an overview of the protocol. Cool. So um, more specifically, we'll be talking about how Mina protocol achieves a constant size blockchain, uh, what a typical block, block production would look like, um, a new kind of marketplace called Snarketplace, and the consensus algorithm. We'll then talk a bit about some of the enhancements that we're planning for the near future. So a lot of you might have heard uh, or read about mm -hmm. Mina Protocol producing a constant size 22 kilobyte blockchain. Um, I kind of want to unpack this a bit and talk about what this means and how this is achieved. Um, so in traditional blockchains, if a new participant wants to join a network, they'll need to check every transaction from the beginning of the blockchain to verify the chain and then start mining, staking, or validating. As the size of the chain grows with the number of transactions processed, this becomes more and more computationally expensive and increases the barrier of entry for new nodes, thereby making the blockchain less decentralized. The way MENA protocol solves this problem is by replacing the entire blockchain with a constant sized verifiable proof. Um, and so instead of downloading the entire history, um, a node in MENA can verify the chain by simply verifying the proof associated with it. Um, and this is made possible by recursive zero-knowledge proofs, specifically ZK snarks. So a ZK snark is a mathematical proof that certifies a computation. By verifying the proof, you verify the computation without having to perform the computation yourself. In the case of MENA, the computation certified by these proofs is that the block was produced correctly and the transactions were applied correctly. And recursive composition of these proofs is what makes this constant sized. So a blockchain snark, in addition to certifying the current state, it also checks that the previous state was correct. So think of blockchain as a state machine where a new block is the input to the transition from the current state to the new state, and a proof for the latest state certifies that the state before was correct and the transition to the new state was performed correctly. Any subsequent proof validates the previous state, which was already certified by a proof corresponding, right? and also certifies the transition to the new state. Therefore, a proof corresponding to a block basically validates the entire chain from the initial state or the genesis block to, to the current block. Uh, now let's look at what's in a block, how a node can verify the block and the account states. So a block that goss gets gossiped around consists of uh, a protocol state, which represents the current state, consists of hashes of various data structures uh, including the ledger. It has the consensus data like the chain height, uh, chain quality, staking or delegation data, and so on. A block consists also consists of a blockchain proof uh, that certifies the chain ending at the given block. It then consists the, uh, the transactions taken from the mempool and transaction snarks, uh, which prove transactions that were included in the previous blocks. So for a user who is interested in validating the blockchain and checking the balances of some accounts, let's say like a full node that is only interested um, in certain accounts, we call these non-consensus nodes because they don't take part in block production. They only need to know the current best protocol state, a proof and a verification key to verify that protocol state, and a Merkle path to the account the user is interested in. So such a node would verify the chain by verifying the proof in the block and would request a Merkle path to the account from the consensus nodes and be able to validate the account state without delegating trust. And so the total size of these components is 11 KB based on current implementation. It was 22 KB when we initially computed, but there have been a lot of improvements since then. So yeah, so this is what it, it will look like for non-consensus nodes. They are not fully implemented yet, and it's something we're planning uh, to add soon. Let's take a look at block producer nodes and how block production typically works in MENA. Block producer nodes or a consensus nodes are the ones that produce blocks and maintain a lot more state than what non-consensus nodes would. Um, so what they maintain is a short history um, of it's a chain of k blocks plus plus a few extra blocks and uh, and any forks that are required for reorg. It maintains the ledger, which is a, a Merkle tree of all the accounts. The scan state, a scan state is basically a collection of 
transactions that are yet to be proven. And then a consensus node also has two kinds of mempool. One is a snark pool, which uh, consists of transaction snarks that prove transactions already included in blocks. And, and lastly, transaction pool is a pool of user transactions that are yet to be included in a block. Um, so let's say given uh, a, a blockchain of length n, um, say a block producer wins the next slot to produce a block with height n, n plus one. Block producer then picks the most profitable transactions from the transaction pool and snark work from the snark pool. It then computes a partial block that consists of uh, the user transactions, transaction snarks, uh, Coinbase, and the protocol state. The producer then generates a proof, uh, which includes verifying the previous proof and performing the transition uh, in the snark. And all of this is then bundled into a block and then broadcasted. So this is how uh, typically a, a block production works. So we talked about um, the blockchain proof and what it stands for. Let's, now let's talk a bit about transaction snarks, snark workers, and, and the snark place and how they all fit together. As I mentioned, um, a blockchain snark also certifies a ledger state, and ledger state is modified by a transaction. Uh, in blockchain snark, we don't apply and verify all of the transactions included in it because doing that, uh, that is generating a proof for each and every transaction in in the block is very expensive and it would take a long time to generate a block if we did that. Instead, what we do is transactions included in blocks are not immediately snarked, but put into scan state, uh, which is a collection of unsnarked transactions. And these unsnarked transactions are then picked up by a new kind of node in MENA called the snark workers. They generate a different snark called the transaction snark for it and broadcast it to the network for block producers to include in blocks. Let's take a look at the life, cy life cycle of a user transaction to help understand this better. So consider um, a steady state of the blockchain where some blocks um, have been generated and they have transactions. Um, snark workers are already producing snarks for those. Say a user makes a payment and broadcasts it to the network, it gets into the mempool and then say a block uh, producer is selected to produce the next block. The block producer then picks most profitable transactions from the local mempool, which may include the, the transaction a user just made. The block producer also needs to add equal the number of transaction snarks to the block. And these snarks correspond to transactions included in previous blocks. Snark workers compete to offer the best price for the snarks required. And the block producer will then include the lowest fee snarks. So what snarks are required and how many snarks are required is basically determined by the scan state. Um, so a scan state is a queue of trees that stores the data required to prove transactions. On each tree, the leaves contain the data to prove transactions and all the intermediate nodes contain data required to recursively merge those proofs from the level below and finally have like one proof at the top that certifies the ledger state. And that one proof basically certifies all the transactions that were that are on that tree and were applied to the ledger. So using the structure, transaction snarks can be produced in parallel, which is where snark workers enter the scene. So a snark worker picks up uh, pending work from the scan state, generates transaction snarks, and broadcasts it to the network, which then goes into the snark pool of block producer nodes. And block producer nodes then retain the lowest fee snark workers, oh, sorry, lowest fee snarks, and then um, include them in their blocks. The transactions from a block that are produced by block producers um, that need to be snark gets added to the scan state, which then creates uh, new work for snark workers. Yes. So let's say in a steady state, uh, some block X includes the final proof from tree one of the scan state, which means the blockchain proof corresponding to block X will also certify the ledger state from applying all the transactions in tree one. The transactions from block X are then added to the end of the queue uh, in the scan state. Meanwhile, snark workers are generating snarks for transactions on say tree two. Uh, and when time comes to generate the next block, a block producer would include the final snark from tree two and um, add any newly included transactions to the end of the queue. And this process sort of continues. Yeah. 
So, so to summarize, um, block producers decide just block producers decide what transactions to include, and snark workers generate proofs for these transactions that the block producer then purchases from them. For each transaction snark included in a block, the block producer pays the fee to the snark worker as part of the same block. Um, and the snark fee is covered by the Coinbase amount and transaction fee. So this, this creates like, a marketplace between the block producers and snark workers, and, and that is what we call a snark place. Um, next, Nathan will talk about the consensus mechanism and give an overview of the future enhancements. Um, all yours, Nathan. All right, so I'm going to go over our uh, consensus mechanism, which is called Ouroboros Samasika. And Ouroboros Samasika is a member of the Ouroboros family of proof of stake consensus mechanisms, which was originally developed by IOHK for use in the Cardano protocol. And what makes this family of proof of stake mechanisms unique is that it's a provably secure family of proof of stake mechanisms. So that means that um, along with the definition of the consensus mechanism, there's also some a series of mathematical proofs that attest to various security properties of that consensus mechanism to help show how that consensus mechanism is impervious to various kinds of adversarial attacks against the network. So I just want to walk through the history of the Ouroboros papers a little bit just to give some more context to where Ouroboros Samasika fits into the family. And so the original Ouroboros uh, proof of stake consensus mechanism was published by IOHK. It, it originally had a limitation that it existed within a synchronous setting, um, which makes it easier to develop the original mathematical proofs for it, but doesn't map very well to how uh, real world blockchains work. Because in the synchronous setting, you assume that all parties operating on the network are always moving in step with each other. Um, so they extended this into another paper called Ouroboros Prous, um, which extended that consensus mechanism, bringing it into a semi-synchronous setting, which more accurately depicts how real cryptocurrency protocols work. Um, and it, as part of that, it refined the consensus mechanism's block producer logic and added some stronger security proofs that uh, consider fully adaptive chain corruption scenarios where adversaries can manipulate um, side chains and then try and resubmit those to the network. Um, and Ouroboros Prowse was a really big uh, move forward for the Ouroboros family, but there was a vulnerability that was found in it, which was uh, long fork attacks, where somebody could maintain a very long side fork and eventually make that fork be selected over an honest chain. And so they extended Ouroboros Prowse one more time in the Ouroboros Genesis, where they layered additional rules on the consensus mechanism, which helped protect against these long fork attacks, um, and also updated the security proofs to show that the new rules are resilient against these long fork attacks. Ouroboros Samasika is our adaptation of the Ouroboros Genesis protocol, where we updated it to work in a succinct setting where our blockchain operates in, where historical information uh, cannot be inspected from the past. Um, and as part of this, there's a number of changes we made, but one of the most notable changes is we implemented a novel uh, long fork protection rule that works within this setting. Um, so I want to go over and highlight uh, an important difference between Ouroboros family of proof of stake mechanisms um, as compared to other proof of stake consensus mechanisms you might be familiar with. Um, and that's how block producer selection works. So I'm first going to go through and show how uh, traditional proof of stake consensus mechanisms solve block producer selection, and then compare and contrast how Ouroboros does it. So in most proof of stake consensus mechanisms, the way that block producer selection works is that you actually take all the blocks that will be produced on the network and you split them up into groups. So in this diagram at the top, I have various block producers that are labeled by color. And in the bottom, I have these white blocks. And these white blocks are not blocks that exist in the blockchain yet. They're blocks that are going to be produced. And you can see how they're bracketed together in groups. So whenever the network gets to a group of blocks that are going to be produced, it elects a leader for that group of blocks. You can imagine the network is rolling a dice that will determine which of these block producers will be allowed to produce blocks for this section. And then a block producer will be selected, and they will produce the blocks in that section. And the network will do another random check. It will roll another dice and select another block producer who will then produce the blocks in that section. Typically, traditional proof of stake consensus mechanisms layer on extra disincentives to this system, such as stake slashing, which are intended to discourage block producers who are selected from uh, refusing to participate or mis uh, misbehaving when it's their time to participate. Um, and this is important because the whole network is essentially electing one person who's in charge of moving the network to, uh, forward at any point in time. So if they choose not to move the network forward, they're just halting the chain and hurting TPS, and they could potentially even do worse things. So 
The common solution to that is stake slashing, where block producers who are selected for a duration have to put certain amount of stake at risk. And if they don't participate correctly, the network will actually take away that stake from them. Comparatively, if we look at how Ouroboros works, um, Ouroboros does not split blocks up into these sections. And the way it does the random check to figure out who wins each block is instead of having a network-wide random check that selects one block producer, every single block producer is doing their own random check based on their stake portion. So every block producer is essentially rolling a dice for every single block, and some of the block producers will win and some of it will lose. So let's just look at this scenario where perhaps purple wins this block, and so purple produces a block. And network goes to the next block, and it does another random selection. But because all of these block producers are rolling their own local random value, that means that you can have scenarios where either no blocks are won, or uh, no, no block producers win the next block, or perhaps multiple block producers win the next block. So if, for instance, both yellow and red won this next block, uh, what would happen is yellow and red would both produce a block on the blockchain. And this introduces a short fork into the chain. In the future, as the chain continues to get developed um, and more block producers are uh, win blocks and choose to produce blocks, um, let's say, for instance, in the next round, blue wins, uh, blue will only extend one of these blocks. So essentially, they will only they will build towards a canonical chain. They'll see both the yellow block and the red block that were created by the previous block producers. And one of those blocks will be stronger than the other uh, in terms of consensus. So. Uh, what blue will do is blue will take the strongest block and build on top of that. So what this means is that every single time there is a conflict in the network with multiple block producers both winning the same position to produce blocks at the same time, there's these short forks that are introduced, but they're quickly resolved when future block producers select between them. And so there's a number of advantages that come when you actually move towards this world of having distributed uh, elections instead of global elections. There's a few things that are easier to do in the protocol implementation, but also something that's interesting about this is that no stake slashing is required for this world because the primary effect of choosing not to participate in block production is, is really just that you reduce your inflation earnings. It's not as if you are the only person who can produce blocks on network and you are seriously uh, hurting the network by not participating. You really are just kind of missing out on your potential to get part of the inflation of the network and you're not having this much larger network-wide effect. Um, your network effect is only proportional to stake you control. So now I wanna go over a little bit about the long fork attack I mentioned before. Um, I think it's an interesting attack to highlight. I wanna mention what is the long fork attack that exists in Ouroboros Prowse? How did Ouroboros Genesis uh, solve it? And then how did we adapt that solution to work in a succinct environment within the context of Ouroboros Samasika? So essentially, the, the way that most chain selection rules work at the end of the day is by, you know, we assume that the honest chain has more stake on it. And so we usually take the longest chain when we compare two chains. But there's a vulnerability to this in Ouroboros, where an adversary can maintain a side chain for a very long period of time, perhaps a year or longer, um, and actually make that chain longer than the honest chain. So to help illustrate how that works, I have a diagram here. You can imagine the top chain that's red are adversarial blocks, and the bottom chain in green is actually the honest chain. So if we imagine the adversary has one fifth of the stake in the system, and then that means there's four fifths of the stake is honest. When they make their side chain, they will have one fifth of the stake there that's operating, and then the main chain will have four fifths of the stake is operating. And this essentially means that the main chain has four times the staking power and should produce four times the blocks of the adversarial side chain. So logically, you would think that the, side, the honest chain would always be longer. But what can happen is that on that side chain, the adversary is the only person who is making any money from the Coinbase rewards, right? There's new money being introduced in the form of Coinbase rewards that gets uh, rewarded to whoever produces every block. On the honest network, those are being distributed up evenly among all the honest nodes that are participating on the network. But on the adversarial chain, it's only being distributed to one account. So over a very, very long time, eventually that adversarial account will have more than four fifths of the stake within its ledger, which is separate from the honest ledger. And that means it will produce blocks faster than the honest chain and eventually it will catch up. So you can see in this diagram, initially when the adversarial forked the chain, it had very low density of blocks. There was a lot of space, but then towards the end, it was producing way more blocks than the honest chain and having a very high density. So eventually it would catch up and surpass the honest chain. So if we just looked at the longest chain rule, we would say, well, this chain's longer, so we're gonna take this. What Ouroboros Genesis decided to do is add an additional rule that says, well, we only take the longest chain 
if these chains are shortly forked from each other. The block they share in common is a really long time ago. Instead, what we're going to do is go back and compare the point at which they forked. And if we see that one of those chains has a weaker density than the other one, then that leads us to believe that that weaker density chain was manipulated and the higher density chain is the honest chain. Um, of course, this was a challenge to adopt in Ouroboros Samasika because we don't have the ability to go back and look at historical information. So the way that we solve this problem is by keeping track of something that we call chain quality. Um, I'm going to kind of go over, uh, elude some of the technical details here, but you can imagine that every single block has a number associated with it that tells us the quality of that block. And so on the, ad on the honest chain, the quality would always stay the same for the most part. And on the adversarial chain, when it first forks away from the honest chain, it would have a, uh, a good quality, but as it's producing blocks, because its blocks are really spaced out, because it has low density, the quality will go down. And once that quality goes down, the quality will never go back up on that chain. So even though they have a long chain in the future with a very good density, when we go and we actually compare the quality of the two blocks we're looking at, we'll see that the honest chain has a better quality, so we'll take it over the other. So this just gives us a succinct way to basically do the same kind of check but just by comparing individual blocks instead of having to go back in the chain and check out other information. Um, so now I'm going to talk really briefly about some of the future enhancements that we want to bring to MENA. Um, so it's been a long road to get here, um, but obviously there's so much more work to do in the future and we're really excited and looking forward. Um, our goal right now is to really make MENA available to anyone, anywhere. And in service of that goal, we want to lower the hardware requirements to operate a consensus node um, so we want to bring down the RAM, CPU, and bandwidth requirements, allowing consensus nodes to be run on regular end-user hardware. We also want to work on the non-consensus network support that Deepthi was mentioning before, which is going to enable full nodes to join the network, access chain state, and submit transactions directly on the network with extremely minimal requirements. Um, and this is going to enable running full nodes in browsers and on mobile devices while forgoing the need to trust a third party. And uh, we believe this will usher in a new era for uh, blockchain integration into other applications. We're also looking forward to scaling the MENA protocol further. Um, so we plan on implementing BitSwap in the peer-to-peer -peer networking layer, which is going to improve the network's bandwidth utilization and give us faster, more distributed bootstrap and synchronization to the network. Um, we're also investigating an upgrade to our core Snarket Place data structure um, that Deepthi was talking about before called Parallel Scan State, um, which we're dubbing Dynamic Parallel Scan. The idea behind this is that it's going to allow the network to dynamically optimize for transaction throughput or transaction snarking latency as the volume of transactions on the network changes over time. So I, that's all we have for today. Um, I hope you were able to take something away from this presentation and that you learned something new about the MENA protocol. Um, you're always welcome to reach out to us on our public Discord to ask any questions or get more technical detail, but I believe we have a few minutes to take some questions right now. Yeah, I was looking at uh, some of the questions and, and answered a few. Um, what is the minimum block producer required to ensure that MENA is secure? Do you mean stake? So we have an assumption of honest stake, which is, um, I believe, 65%. Um, are there history nodes that Mina uses for transaction history? Um, oh, cool. Christine replied to that. Um, but yes, we do have archive nodes uh, if you want to store the transactions for reporting or auditing or other purposes. Um, how many transactions does the Mina protocol allow per second? So um, right now, the transaction throughput is dependent on the scan state size, and right now it's fixed. So current configuration is that uh, it allows 0.2 uh, transactions per second. Um, I know it's low, but like Nathan mentioned, we are currently um, planning on improving that. Um, so yeah, that, that'll that be one of our future enhancements. Uh, I was just gonna say, I see some number of forks happening um, and they're asking what the reason is for this. Uh, that that kind of goes back to the slide I was showing um, where I was explaining how when multiple block producers both win the same slot um, to produce a block, how there's a short fork that's introduced, but that fork gets resolved. So it's by design of Ouroboros that there are some overlapping blocks um, and it is expected. Um, cool, let's let's take some more um, consensus related questions. There's one question which says, uh, 
Ouroboros doesn't have finality. Do you want to take that, Nathan? Sure, yeah. Um, Ouroboros does have finality. And in fact, in the papers, they have a, a proof that gives you a, a probabilistic finality that's overwhelming. Um, it's just that this finality that for the overwhelming probabilistic finality, it's very long. Um, however, that said, uh, if you want, if you consider finality more like how Bitcoin considers finality, um, Ouroboros does perform pretty similar to how proof of work finality uh, operates on Bitcoin. So I don't remember the exact numbers, but it, it's a pretty small number of probabilistic finality for the same level of confidence that Bitcoin gives you. Yeah, um, if I remember correctly, it's with uh, nine, 90, 90% honest participation. Um, you get 15 blocks with a 99.9% .9 of confidence. Um, yeah, that sounds sounds right to me. Our website would probably have like accurate data. Yeah. How far are we in the implementation of this product? Uh, I assume you're referring to the whole MENA protocol. I mean, the protocol is launched. Uh, it works. So, um, but we're we're very close. Uh, we believe to being able to support some of the other features we were talking about, such as non-consensus networks. And a lot of the prototyping is done there, and it's really just about fleshing out the the software. Um, I'll just take one last question, which is, is there a possibility to manage Snarket Place better? Because many Snarkers are unaware of how Snarket Place works and they're selling zero mina. So um, this whole marketplace is kind of free market. Um, block producers choose what Snarks they want to buy. Um, and so the current implementation is to pick the lowest fee. And if someone's producing Snarks for zero, zero fee, then that's what would go um, but I'm, I'm interested to see how this uh, works as a protocol, as the chain continues and, um, and more and more transactions are included. So um, 